antenatal physiology and nursing care. The antenatal, or we can call it prenatal or pregnancy period, is a time of great physical and psychological changes. As nurses, we must be aware of and understand these changes to fully care for our clients and their families during this critical time of fetal growth and development. So we'll discuss some of the physiological changes that occur in pregnancy, but I want to touch on some psychological things that we also should consider. Psychologically, we should be aware of the woman's acceptance of the pregnancy. Was this a planned pregnancy, um, unplanned pregnancy, or mistimed pregnancy, etc.? cetera? Um, discussing with the mother um, her preparation for childbirth and keep it in mind that women may have various um, emotional feelings towards the pregnancy that may change as the pregnancy progresses. Feelings of ambivalence, acceptance, um, emotional um, li libeity, and body image alterations. Here I've broken down um, key hormones that are um, major players in the prenatal or in pregnancy uh, for a woman. And I've divided them into hormones that are uh, placental, produced or maintained by the placenta, and then those non-placental hormones. And so I would encourage you to um, read in your text um, these different types of hormones and the roles that they play in pregnancy. Okay, how will a woman know that she is pregnant? Well, signs of pregnancy can be divided into three different categories, starting from the least reliable indicators to the most reliable indicator that a pregnancy is happening or has happened, that the woman has um, conceived. And they are pre presumptive signs, probable signs, and then positive signs, which you should know the difference between all three. Presumptive signs are signs that can indicate pregnancy, but also have a high chance that these signs could be related to some other cause. So therefore, they are the least reliable indicators of pregnancy. So some presumptive signs are, one, amenorrhea, no menses, breast tenderness, fatigue, nausea and vomiting, urinary frequency, and quickening. Quickening is uh, the feeling of fetal movement. So any of these signs could be related to other things outside of pregnancy. So breast tenderness could be an indication that pregnancy is about, uh, or that a menses is about to occur. Nausea and vomiting could be related to any other um, to another GI related symptom. Urinary frequency can be a urinary tract infection. Quickening can again be related to some GI symptoms. So these signs are not positive indicators that, they're, that a woman is pregnant because they could be related to something else. Next, there are probable signs of pregnancies. And these are um, signs that are detected on a physical exam by the provider. So presumptive would be subjective data that the woman presents um, or complains of. Probable signs are um, op more objective and are detected on a physical exam by the provider. And they're more reliable than the presumptive, but still not a 100% um, indicator. So things like abdominal enlargement, something called Chadwick sign, 
which is a bluish color to the cervix or on the vaginal area. So that could be seen by inserting the speculum. Um, Hagar's sign, Hagar's, H-E-G-A-R, is the softening of the isthmus. If you remember the anatomy of the uterus, the isthmus is the lower segment of the uterus. So upon a physical um, exam, a provider can feel the softening of that. Goodall's is the softening of the cervix and a positive pregnancy test. And so uh, for most of these things, you know, for some of these things, I should say that there could be other reasons for um, these findings on an exam. So an abdominal or uterine enlargement can also be due to if a woman has uterine fibroids. Um, the um, effect of the cervix um, can also be related to does she have a infection of the cervix. Um, Pregnancy tests are generally more uh, reliable, but it depends on what type of test it is. A uh, blood pregnancy test is um, more accurate than a, uh, more sensitive than a urine pregnancy test. And all of these tests are looking for the hormone HCG, human um, chorionic gonadotropin hormone which is pre present in pregnancy, which can be detected in the blood um, prior to it reaching um, the urine. And this number, this HCG number doubles every day um, for the first 42 to 72 um, days of pregnancy, and then it plateaus. So probable signs are more reliable than presumptive, but not 100%. Only positive signs of pregnancy are 100% reliable in determining pregnancy. And this is because these signs are only present when there is a pregnancy. Things like auscultation of a fetal heartbeat, visualization, of a fetus by an ultrasound and upon palpating the abdomen fetal movements are palpated and fetal parts are felt so those are positive signs 100 percent reliable that a pregnancy is taking place okay now that we've determined that she's pregnant now it's time for prenatal care. Prenatal care is a system of health care designed to improve outcomes during, after, and between pregnancies. It can, for some women, be their first interaction with health care systems, um, made in the hospital settings or health care professionals in general. It's an assessment of wellness and risk it is a time of ongoing educate, education, and it's an opportunity to intervene, to promote health, and to manage or treat complications that, may, uh, that a woman may present or that may arise during the pregnancy. And it's an opportunity to form a healthcare relationship. And so it's crucial as nurses that we take an active role in a woman's prenatal care. As nurses who work in maternal child, during this prenatal period, we're generally the coordinator of the care. Provider of prenatal education and some physical and psychological support um, we provide a lot of an anticipatory guidance to our clients. Um, we're assessing maternal risk factors throughout the pregnancy and the facilitator of care, meaning we're setting up the referrals, um, 
referring women to support groups, etc. And so it's the, a key is to, re, to build a rapport with not only the pregnant woman, but with her family. How do we determine a woman's due date? Here's a link that describes Nagel's rule. And Nagel's rule is a method that we use based on a woman's last known menstrual period, her LNP. And again, it's an estimated due date. So when you see EDD, the key word is estimated. Um, and so we should note that only about 5% of women deliver on their EDD. And most women deliver somewhere within seven days before or after that. But it's important to establish the due date because that determines her gestational age throughout the pregnancy. And what we'll note is that there are certain tests that are only available during certain time periods in the pregnancy. And so we need to keep track of how many weeks a woman is pregnant. Also that there are key fetal developments that occur within um, these weeks. And so it's, it's key that we have a good um, estimated due date that we follow. So please look at the link, pay attention to um, um, how to determine um, an estimated due date because you'll see that again. And in this video, she provides a link to um, some practice um, test questions and give examples of how to um, determine um, an estimated due date using Nagel's rule. Pregnancy is divided into three trimesters. Each trimester is approximately 13 weeks long, and it's important to know and memorize these trimesters as significant fetal growth, specific maternal and fetal testing occurs in each trimester, and the timing of prenatal visits is also, also corresponds to the trimester a woman is in. And so um, healthcare providers talk about trimester in weeks and um, the lay public will talk about their pregnancy in months. Like they would say, I'm four months pregnant. Well, that can be, is she at 13 weeks? Is she at 15 weeks? So for healthcare providers, we use weeks, but women and their families will um, mainly talk about their pregnancy in months. There are two types of um, prenatal care methods that women have an option for. Um, the traditional method of prenatal care in which a woman has one-on-one -on -one contact with um, her provider and um, the supporting healthcare staff and a fairly newer model, um, centering pregnancy or group prenatal care in which women who have um, the same, around the same estimated due date are put in a cohort and these women have um, prenatal care together. So women of similar gestation ages are put together in these cohorts. They have uh, private exam times. If there's a vaginal exam that needs to be done, otherwise they learn together about um, the pregnancy. So there is a, um, uh, a session where there are classes about discomforts of pregnancy. Women are able to share experiences. And um, this started in the, the late 90s um, for women from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to come together and have um, support during their pregnancies. And so there's a um, growing body of scientific evidence, um, both qualitative and quantitative research that discusses um, women's satisfaction, um, increased um, 
rates of um, good pregnancy and birth outcomes and the cost effectiveness of centering pregnancy. So um, as you can see in the slide here, the, the comparison of um, the timing of these visits um, where uh, traditional one-on-one uh, -on -one prenatal visits start off um, once a month until a woman reaches 28 weeks which is that third trimester and she goes every two weeks until 36 weeks and then weekly visits at 36 weeks until she delivers and um, you can see the the breakdown for a centering pregnancy and so please note that um, these visits can increase in frequency if a woman becomes um, high risk during her pregnancy if there's complications or if she um, presents to the pregnancy as a high-risk pregnancy. So if she's pregnant with um, twins or if she has um, uh, diabetes or she develops diabetes in pregnancy, the number of visits would change. And um, note that women, if, um, if offered, can start off in traditional, pregnant, uh, traditional prenatal care and switch to centering or group pregnancy, group prenatal care if it's offered, and vice versa if they're in a centering uh, type of uh, group prenatal care and they choose to um, switch to tr traditional, uh, women should be uh, should know if that option is available. Here I just provided some things that um, should take place in that first or initial OB visit. And you can see that that visit is typically the longest visit throughout um, prenatal care. Um, subsequent visits will be much shorter, but that first initial visit is a time of gathering lots of information um, that, can, that will be used to uh, one, assess um, if the woman is a high or low risk pregnancy and if there's any um, underlying or early um, issues that need to have uh, be closely monitored uh, or if any interventions need to um, occur. I can't stress enough how valuable um, a good history is in pregnancy or just in in nursing in general. Um, determining medical, um, getting a medical history, um, looking for any chronic diseases, including how these um, diseases are being managed, um, obstetric history, knowing any type of pregnancies, any miscarriages or abortions, whether they were spontaneous or elective, um, was there any complications in any pregnancies? Um, learning about a woman's labor and birth history gives us a glimpse into um, what may happen in this current pregnancy, any surgeries that a woman has had, um, especially if she's had a cesarean section in the past, want to know what type of um, uterine incision was made because that determines if um, she's a candidate for VBAC and remember that the vaginal birth after a cesarean, um, what was the indication for the C-section, those things help us to, to just to stay aware of things we should look out for in this current pregnancy. So a good history is invaluable. So here I'll just give you an example of how um, an obstetric history impacts the care of the current pregnancy a woman presents. So let's just say woman A had a history of poor pregnancy outcomes. She had a baby with inter inter uterine growth restriction and it was SGA, meaning small for gestational age. And so 
knowing that information, we're going to give more attention to her weight gain and fetal growth with this current pregnancy. Um, obstetric history may help determine where the woman can deliver. If she's had a history of um, labor complications or she's deemed as high risk, then she may not be able to have a uh, delivery um, in a low risk setting, such as a um, such as home, that she may need um, higher tech uh, observation or assessment during um, her labor. Um, it may also determine who her provider can be at the birth. Um, if a woman is uh, has a lot of chronic um, uncontrolled um, diseases such as uncontrolled diabetes or if she is pregnant with multiples um, she may not be a candidate for um, nurse midwifery care um, throughout the pregnancy and labor if she's going to require a um, repeat c-section that the midwife would not be the um, primary surgeon to provide that um, c-section uh, midwives who have been trained can be first assist but they uh, were not trained to uh, perform cesarean sections um, on our on our patients so knowing the obstetric history impacts the current pregnancy in multiple ways here I've listed um, in detail some laboratory tests that are um, obtained at that initial prenatal visits, um, things like blood type and RH factor, and we'll talk about the importance of knowing if a woman is um, positive or negative for RH. So if she's A negative versus A positive, B negative, B positive, those types of deals. Um, knowing her CBC, is she anemic? Um, and requiring um, additional iron supplementation. Um, have we screened her for um, rubella? Have we screened her for syphilis, hepatitis, all those things, HIV, um, doing a CCMS, which is a clean catch midstream urine analysis, um, to see if there's any um, urinary tract infection, um, doing other sexually transmitted infection screening if she is um, high risk for sickle cell um, anemia or sickle cell trait, um, doing a hemoglobin electrophoresis. So again, being culturally aware of what women are um, at a higher risk for sickle cell um, disease or traits. So women of African descent or um, doing cystic fibrosis um, testing for women, again, who, at, who are at a higher risk um, for carrying these, these different diseases. In your obstetrical history that you gather from your clients, you're going to document and make record of a woman's gravita and parity. These are terms to describe previous pregnancy outcomes. Um, looking at how many times a woman has been pregnant, which is gravita, parity, how many times that uh, she's actually gone through labor. And parity is divided further down into T for term pregnancies, how many pregnancies went to term, P, how many of those pregnancies the outcome was preterm? A, how many of those pregnancies ended in abortion? And they mixed together miscarriages um, and elective abortions in that category. And then L, how many living children um, the woman currently has? And so gravita is all of the time she's been pregnant, including her current pregnancy. And so this video will go into um, deep detail. And I, I like these videos because she's gearing them towards um, 
NCLEX preparation. So um, pay close attention to um, this video and become familiar with Gravita and Parity and how to uh, document that based on the information that you're given because you will see it again. And here you can see um, things that should be included in subsequent prenatal visits and keeping in mind that in addition to um, the more focused physical exam, you know, looking at the blood pressure, checking the fundal height, listening to the baby's heartbeat, things like that, that this is a key time throughout the entire pregnancy for education, education, education. Um, preparing this family for labor, pre talking about postpartum, all those things should be happening in the prenatal period over the course of the pregnancy. Um, anticipatory guidance, you know, as a woman is approaching the second trimester, what things should she be looking for? Um, what type of discomforts are most common in the second trimester and what's common in the third trimester? When should she start feeling the baby move? Those are things that we constantly, as nurses, are charged with in the prenatal period is that education. As you can see here, I've listed some follow-up um, lab tests that are done throughout the pregnancy um, after that initial uh, list of labs are done at the first prenatal visit. There are some follow-up or repeat labs that are done throughout the pregnancy. And so as you can see in the parentheses, I have the time period and weeks when these tests um, should be done. And so again, that's why it's important for us to understand and, and get a um, accurate estimated date of delivery so that we can plan out when these um, test and other surveillances are appropriate and done. And then we can do anticipatory teaching with our clients and letting them know what tests are coming up and educate them on what these tests are and what they should expect. And so we'll go into some of these um, in more detail as we get further into our antepartum um, unit. I think I mentioned in um, the uh, when I was talking about probable signs of pregnancy, the term quickening. This is that mom's um, first perception of uh, fetal movement. Um, for primates, women who this is their very first pregnancy, um, quickening can occur around 18 to 20 weeks gestation. And for women who've had pregnancies before, it may happen a bit sooner, between 16 and 18 weeks. And so um, quickening can be useful in helping to um, estimate or determine um, pregnancy dating. For example, if we have a woman who um, presents to us who's had no prenatal care, but she... Um, states that she feels some fetal movement or that there's some movement going on in her abdomen. And so we can kind of maybe estimate or guesstimate that she's probably around that 18, 20 weeks um, gestation. So using that as a marker, not the sole indicator of her gestational age, but we can have an idea that she's further along than that first trimester if she's perceiving some fetal movement, if she's indeed pregnant. An important physical assessment that happens in each uh, prenatal visit, starting around 20 weeks gestation, is recording the fundal height measurement. Remember the fundus is the top of the uterus. And so we use the fundal height measurement as a measurement to assess fetal growth um, and determining if the baby is growing appropriately 
or if there's some growth restriction or if the baby's measuring small for gestational age or if it's measuring large for gestational age, which has indications of other um, um, complications in pregnancy that we'll get to. So just a, a, a overview or review of the anatomy. So if you can see on this picture here, the symphys pubis is the bone that's at your pubic bone, the top of the pelvic here. And then you're measuring the top from that symphys pubis to the top of the fundus. The top of the uterus is the fundus. And so you want to palpate, find the top of the uterus and take the tape measure and then end it at the symphys pubis, or you can start at the symphys pubis and measure all the way up to the top of the fundus. So these measurements should correspond with the gestational age. For example, at 12 weeks, the top of the fundus should be right around the symphys pubis area. So it would be a bit difficult to palpate um, the fundus. If you feel the fundus outside of the symphys pubis, that would be an indication that this pregnancy may be greater than 12 weeks. At 20 weeks gestation, the top of the fundus should be at the umbilicus, at the umbilical site. After 20 weeks, the fundus should rise approximately one centimeter a week. And after 24 weeks gestation, when we're measuring, we measure give or take two centimeters. So you give a two plus or minus centimeter window when you're measuring the fundal height. And so as you can see, we're measuring the fundal height in centimeters. So for example, if I have a client who is 24 weeks gestation by her estimated due date, when I measure the top of her fundus, a normal range would be anywhere from 22 to 26 centimeters would be appropriate. And so um, we use fundal height as a very low key um, way of assessing fundal um, fetal growth. And so there's various things that can affect um, the fundal height. If there's multiple gestations, that's going to throw off the fundal height because it's always going to measure large. If the baby is lying in a um, awkward lie, that can throw off the um, fundal height. If there is too much amniotic fluid, that can throw off the fundal height as well. Um, so there's other things outside of just fetal growth that could have an impact on fundal height. And so it's important that at every prenatal visit, especially starting at that 20 week gestation, that fundal height are measured. And I provided a very quick, um, a link to a very quick video that gives a um, demonstration of fundal height. And in that video, they're starting the measurement from the top of the uterus, the fundus, down to the symphys pubis. Um, in order to auscultate or to listen to the fetal heartbeat, um, there's two um, things that we can use, a fetal scope and a Doppler. Um, a fetal scope is probably less likely used. It's a basically a stethoscope um, to listen to fetal heart tones. Uh, what you will most likely see is an electronic uh, fetal Doppler that um, is like a mini ultrasound that, that captures um, the, um, the waves from the heartbeat and gives a digital reading of the fetal heart rate. And so when we're doing a fetal scope, again, we want to listen um, for a full minute. Um, same with the Doppler and get uh, what the average um, reading is. And so with a Doppler, we can um, listen to fetal heart tones as early as 12 weeks. Um, with a fetal scope, 
uh, more likely at, at 20 weeks. And so if we're able to auscultate fetal heart tones um, in a woman who doesn't know her um, last normal menstrual period and we're unable to determine her um, estimated due date by using the Nagels because we don't have her period, if we do an exam and we aren't able to palpate the fundus outside of the symphys pubis, if we're able to hear the fetal heart tones, then we can we can estimate that she's at least about 12 weeks pregnant. I mean, these women with um, unknown last menstrual periods uh, eventually will need to um, have an ultrasound to um, determine the estimated due date. But we can have some type of um, picture or guess of where we think that she may be. Ultrasounds. Women can and do experience low risk pregnancies with no ultrasounds. However, many and most American women have at least one ultrasound during their pregnancy. And so ultrasounds have, um, you know, ultrasounds can be done at various times throughout the pregnancy if needed. For example, if uh, the last known menstrual period is unavailable or she can't remember or doesn't know, then an ultrasound can help us determine um, an estimated fetal, uh, estimated due date um, by measuring um, the crown rump length. And it, it is exactly what it, uh, it measures exactly what it says. It's measuring the crown of the head to the fetal bottom, to the buttocks. And they use that measurement along with a biparietal diameter that's across the, the largest part of the head um, used to, they use those measurements and make calculations to determine an um, estimated due date. When we're looking at ultrasounds for determining due dates, the earlier the ultrasound, the more accurate the estimated due date is. So if a woman um, has an early first trimester ultrasound, that due date is more accurate than a 28 or 40, uh, 28 to 36 week or later in the third trimester pregnancy ultrasound. So women will if they have an initial ultrasound and we have a due date, we stick with that due date. And if they, for some reason, need an ultrasound some later, somewhere later down the road in the pregnancy, and that date is different from that initial one, you explain to the patients that the earlier the ultrasound, the more accurate the estimated due date. So let's say we have a patient who has a long, uh, last known menstrual period and it gives us a, a due date of let's say august 4th for some reason she needed an early um, first trimester uh, ultrasound um, for testing of, of some genetic um, reason and that due date said august 7th we wouldn't change her estimated due date from August 4th to August 7th because it's within a one, one to two week period. If for some reason she gives us that, dis, that due date of August 4th based off of her last menstrual period and we have an early trimester ultrasound and that ultrasound says that the due date is August 24th, then that's a big discrepancy and we're more likely to go with the early ultrasound estimated due date. And, you know, getting that estimated due date as close to accurate as possible is important because we don't want to have a two, three week discrepancy and we think a woman is further along in the pregnancy than she is. And if she goes past her due date one to two weeks and we induce her and then we induce a baby who really wasn't 41 
weeks. Now we've delivered a premature baby. So getting those estimated due dates as accurate as possible is important. And so um, if a woman knows her last known menstrual period and there is no early ultrasound, we go with that unless there's other indications. Why? So usually um, ultrasounds, the first ultrasound that a woman would have is around 18 to 20 weeks. And that ultrasound is used to um, check fetal growth. Um, and the sex of the baby can be um, determined at that time if the baby is cooperative. Um, the part is there. It's just a matter if the baby is willing to show it or not. And so if a woman is unable to, if the um, sonographer is unable to see the sex of the baby, that's not an indication to have a repeat um, ultrasound. So if a woman has only one ultrasound in pregnancy, it's usually at that 18 to 20 weeks. And so um, later ultrasound, pre uh, later pregnancy ultrasounds um, are only as indicated if there is some, some reason for, for that. Just to, some um, changes to the cardiovascular system to be noted um, related to physiological changes in pregnancy. Um, there's increased cardiac output and volume for obvious reason. The mom is supplying um, blood for both her and the growing and developing fetus so that her, uh, so up on an, an exam, her pulse might be increased. Um, Usually blood pressure changes, there's a decrease um, in uh, blood pressure and this decrease is due to a decrease in peripheral vascular resistance because we want more blood to pump out. We want more blood getting to the placenta to transfer to the fetus. Um, so those changes, um, again, um, usually a slight decrease, we want to look out for supine hypotensive syndrome and this is usually around that 24 28 weeks that third trimester for sure and this syndrome happens when a woman is lying flat on her back for greater um, than five minutes um, when she gets up she'll experience some uh, reflex bradycardia um, she may feel faint or dizzy, and so we encourage moms um, starting in that third trimester not to lie flat because the weight of the growing fetus in that uterus presses on the inferior vena cava and causes this supine hypotensive syndrome. And so um, we'll talk about lying flat and how we have women deliver in a position that may not be, or that has been shown not to be the most um, effective way to supply oxygenation and blood to the fetus, yet we still do it. Remember I talked about the importance of um, the nurse's role in education in the prenatal period, and particularly talking about um, anticipatory guidance and so one of the key things is preparing or discussing with women and their families some of the common discomforts of pregnancy and ways to um, help with those discomforts so um, in the next couple of slides I give examples of discomforts in each trimester and um, and a lot of these uh, discomforts in the first trimester are related to hormonal changes, um, the increase in um, estrogen and progesterone, um, and the presence of HCG can cause many of these discomforts in pregnancy. For example, nausea and vomiting um, has been linked to the increase in HCG. Um, Progesterone, increased progesterone relaxes, is a, a smooth muscle relaxer. So um, the bladder 
the ureters dilate so a woman may um, have more urinary frequency but again you want to discuss the difference between normal urinary frequency and a urinary tract infection um, constipation is um, related to the incre increase in progesterone um, and so you want to talk about ways to decrease your risk of constipation, increasing water intake, fiber, being active, those types of deals. So you want to talk about those changes that are going to occur and these discomforts and also provide some um, guidance and interventions to um, alleviate or help with these discomforts. And so again, in the next couple of slides, I give examples of discomforts in the second and third trimester as well. Hyperemesis gravidarium is more than the normal nausea um, and vomiting that women have in pregnancy. Hyperemesis for short uh, occurs when a woman has um, constant nausea with vomiting where she cannot keep anything down including water and that we're noting that there is a decrease in weight so there's some weight loss and there's a um, high levels of ketones in her urine and so these women will need um, uh, may need hospitalization to get um, IV hydration um, may need TPN um, or some kind of um, nutritional support and medications to treat the nausea and vomiting. And so again, hyperemesis is more than just the normal feeling nauseated or vomiting um, every once in a while, that this is a constant um, nausea and vomiting that has affected a woman's um, ADLs and there is some physical um, changes that have occurred because she can't keep anything down. One common discomfort that women will um, complain of in the second trimester is called round ligament pain. If you think about, again, going back to the anatomy of the uterus, there are ligaments that hold the uterus in place. And these uterus, or these ligaments, if you think of them as rubber bands, begin to stretch with the growing uterus, of the gro with the growing fetus inside. And so when these ligaments get stretched, a woman may feel a lot of burning or pain in the side areas, and especially when she moves from one position to the other or getting out of bed or getting out of the car, she may have a, uh, a, a, a sharp stabbing pain with some, with some movements. And so you want to, again, discuss these things um, as normal occurrences and to um, help women di differentiate them from other uh, complications that may be occurring if they're false contractions or are they contractions. So, um, you know, round ligament pains do not come and go like cramps. They're, you know, sharp pains usually associated with some type of movement and that you want to offer some type of um, method for relief. So things like belly bands where it provides an extra support for that growing um, uterus and so it takes some of the pressure off of those um, ligaments that support the uterus. Now let's talk about maternal nutrition. There used to be the old adage that when a pregnant woman is eating, she can say, I'm, feed, I'm eating for two, and that it was acceptable to just have a free-for-all for whatever she wanted to eat and how much she wanted to eat. Well, we, we now know um, through research that um, 
pregnancy weight gain is a contributing factor for obesity in the postpartum period and thereafter. And um, so the pregnancy weight guidelines have been revised and that there are uh, women depending on their BMI are encouraged to gain a certain amount of weight throughout the pregnancy. Um, because we know that excessive pregnancy weight gain contributes to lifelong obesity. And we also know that in the states that more than 50% of women are overweight or obese prior to pregnancy. So women are already coming to the pregnancy with extra weight. And so we don't want to, um, we, we don't want to diet during pregnancy, but we also want to monitor um, the weight gain in pregnancy. And so uh, more than a third of women gain more than the recommended weight during pregnancy. And I will admit I was one of those women as well and still trying to get off the quote unquote baby fat and my youngest is eight. So um, <laughs> maternal um, nutrition and having that discussion and monitoring that is extremely important. Prenatal education, again, is a major nursing responsibility and should be done over multiple prenatal visits. Every prenatal visit is an opportunity to educate your clients. Um, note that RNs are often um, teaching childbirth classes um, that are attended by the pregnant women and their, their partners. Um, during the prenatal education or prenatal visits, you know, you do an assessment, you develop a plan of what it is that you uh, want to talk about or need to talk about, and then document. Document so that you know what has happened um, in subsequent prenatal vi visits and that it shows that the teaching has occurred. The next couple of slides just give examples of information that should be covered and um, prenatal visits and you know as you assess your patients um, educational needs um, and experience you determine what information is needed you ask the patient if they have questions and so and these things may be needed to be talked about multiple times not just at the first visit you know where the woman and her family is overwhelmed with information already it may need to happen over subsequent visits and um, not necessarily a, a one time, I've asked the question, I'm gonna check it off my list type deal. So you you start off the conversation, you, you do the teaching, you do some follow-up and you ask if there are, are questions. So again, the next couple of slides talks about prenatal um, teaching at the initial visits or in that first trimester, et cetera. Um, subsequent visits, um, information about danger signs that you want to make your, your clients aware of, um, general um, things to watch out for, reasons to, to call the office, the hospital, what have you. Um, talk about lifestyle um, changes regarding work and exercise and um, always talking about how a woman is feeling. Don't forget the um, psychosocial aspect of pregnancy and life in general and how that can impact um, pregnancy as well. One of the big questions um, that you will encounter with your cl pregnant clients is what can I take as far as medications? What things are safe in pregnancy? 
Um, and so I've listed here the different um, categories. When you see this is category B or A, um, it's referring to um, related to pregnancy. So category A and B drugs are um, have been shown to um, be safe in pregnancy. Category C um, drugs are those drugs that you have to weigh the risk um, versus benefits of those drugs. So for example, if a woman was taking um, a antidepressive medication and it's a category C, well, if she has tried um, the category B um, drugs like a Prozac and it has not been effective, then Zoloft um, would be recommended to continue because we know that, you know, her psychosocial or, or mental health is just as important as the physical health. And so the risk would outweigh, uh, the benefits would outweigh any uh, potential risk. So when we get to the category Ds and Acts, these are drugs that we, um, that would not be used in, in pregnancy because they have been shown to have um, a uh, teratogenic effect on fetal, um, on human development based off of tests on, on animals that this can have an impact on um, fetal development. So these drugs are uh, not used in pregnancy category D and X. And then I've given um, a list here of over-the-counter um, drugs that are safe in pregnancy um, as well on the previous on the next slide there are um, certain immunizations that are safe to um, get in pregnancy and then there are other ones that are not um, any vaccine that uses a killed virus uh, may be given in pregnancy so a woman can receive an hepatitis b um, a tetanus um, diphtheria rabies or flu vaccine in pregnancy um, and we encourage women to pregnant women to get the flu vaccine. Um, I am in pregnancy. Um, vaccines that are live viruses like rubella or chickenpox or mumps um, are not to be given in pregnancy. Um, these women should, if they are um, rubella, non-immune, should receive that vaccination in the postpartum period. Um, and this is where, again, preconception counseling would come into play because you would do the screening and, and find that a woman is not immune to rubella, offer her that vaccination prior to pregnancy, and then encourage her not to conceive for the literature differs anywhere from one to three months after receiving one of these live um, vaccination. So there are some viruses that, yes, uh, vaccinations, I'm sorry, that can be given during pregnancy. And then there are others that are contraindicated that a woman should wait until after um, the pregnancy to get the vaccinations or if she did preconception counseling to have it prior to conceiving. I want to close this um, this module here to talk about other things to consider in antenatal prenatal care. Um, when you talk uh, about the type of clients you're going to take care of, not all um, women are going to have a um, heterosexual relationship and that they're, or are even married and that you may have clients who are teens or single, or there may be same sex um, partners, even military families, offer a different culture and um, require different um, needs. And so we have to be attentive and aware of who our client is, what her needs are, and tailor her prenatal care um, to fit the needs of the client. So not all prenatal um, care 
looks exactly alike. There are some fundamental foundational things that go into the prenatal visit, but especially that education piece is tailored toward um, the woman and her family support person's needs. And then consider siblings and grandparents or whoever her support persons may be. And again, the prenatal period is a crucial time of, of teaching and preparing this family for the birth of a, of a new child here. And so we have to um, take, take our role serious and be aware of changes and be able to provide the education and support that families need during this prenatal period.